We've got a camera of a camera of a camera of a camera. That'll work. You go away. You check the hardware. Yeah, we got the hardware. You give me a channel in the AMP1 class, Tuesday, Thursday, 2. Go, baby, go. Dot. Do you have your clicker? Oh, well, then we're not going to use the clicker. To <laughs> no, we will. We're on channel D like David. Damn it, I hate when that happens. Okay, again, kind of as I was saying, we're going to go through part A and part B today on channel 10. Uh, you and I meet um, today, which is Tuesday, of course, then class is on Thursday, and our last class of the semester is next Tuesday, a week from today. That gives us three days to go over parts A, B, C, and D. We're going to handle part A and B pretty easily today, frankly, and still have some time in the lab. On Thursday, uh, you'll go over more of Chapter 10, Part C, probably, and then some time in the lab. Uh, and we'll see how far that we can get on that day. Uh, and then we'll have some time next Tuesday to finish this up and maybe even have a little bit of review, although there's, I think, already a review online for you. I've also posted on uh, Mastering AMP the uh, end of chapter assignment for Chapter 9, the beginning of Chapter 10, and those are both due this Friday. I've also put up the end of chapter for 10 along with a drag and drop uh, kind of learn the muscles exercise. Uh, and those are due next Friday. They're actually due after we're done with class but before your final. So all of the mastering assignments are up. And if you care to get them all done right now and know kind of where you are on that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not going to go gather all those grades and post the averages on to uh, Desire to Learn, which is where those are going to end up until uh, after next Friday the 9th which is the last due date, because I don't want to go start getting three here, four there, 12 of them here. Still 20 people hadn't finished. You know, so I'm going to wait until the due dates are finished, which will be the 9th of December, uh, the Friday before our final will be the earliest that I drag those over and post them in Desire to Learn, just so you don't start sending me emails saying, hey, when are we going to see that? Well, after the last due date, so I know everybody's had a chance to get it done. So off we go on Chapter 10, the muscular system, and again, if you haven't joined me, we're on channel D. And what we're going to be doing in uh, the day today is to get a little bit of background terminology out of the way. And then we'll begin learning some specific muscles. And again, I'm going to go over a lot of the muscles that are in your lab book. I'll show them to you on some of the models. Uh, we'll look at them in some videos. We'll watch them in motion. Uh, but I'm not going to drag open the lab book and say, okay, here on page 56, or frankly, whatever the heck pages those are because I don't have them memorized, uh, be sure you get this muscle, this muscle, this muscle. The list of muscles in, is in your lab book. Uh, I'll hit on probably 60 to 80 percent of them as I go through the chapter, but uh, it's still going to be your responsibility to find the specific list of muscles that's in your lab book. And I will show you the bulk of them, although not 100 percent of them. Uh, I would venture to say that every single muscle in that list is findable in uh, pictures in your textbook, pictures in your coloring book, videos which are on Desire to Learn, sorry, not Desire to Learn, but videos which are on Mastering in the study area, and the videos I'll show you today are in the study area on Mastering if you'd like to play with it. But before we start that, we need to deal with some terminology, which is kind of frankly where we start most of our chapters. The first set of terms is on these first two pages. First of all, we'll start with the term prime mover, and this is sort of kind of what it sounds like, the main muscle that provides movement at a particular joint is described as the prime mover of that joint. Um, any joint you can think of, whether it's your knee or your ankle or your wrist or your elbow, generally has at least two opposing motions. And I'll go back to the elbow because it's an easy one. Uh, it's My elbow is high enough that even people in the back of the room can see it. Uh, as I uh, move my elbow, I have two main motions I can make. I can flex it, and I can extend it. And for each of those motions, there's a prime mover. Uh, so the prime mover for flexing is actually, oddly enough, not the, the biceps like you might think, but the brachialis, uh, which we'll learn 
probably on Thursday. Uh, and the one that straightens the arm back out, extends it, is the triceps on the back of the arm. So those two muscles together do sort of the opposite of each other. One flexes the elbow, the other straightens it. And we call muscles that do kind of those two opposing pairs antagonist, or they're sometimes described as antagonistic pairs. And by definition, an antagonistic pair or a pair of antagonists um, undo the motion of the other. One does a motion, the other will undo it, and then they'll kind of trade back and forth. Uh, they oppose or reverse any particular motion. Uh, synergists are groups of muscles that add force to a movement. Uh, they reduce undesirable or unnecessary movement. And the biceps, the one that you've thought forever your whole life was the main one that flexes your elbow, is really not the prime mover. It's a synergist. The main mover there is the brachialis. We'll see that again on Thursday. And while it's doing most of the motion there, the biceps is helping it. Uh, fixators are muscles that help to stabilize bones around a joint uh, and kind of hold them steady. You're going to see a little bit later in the day when we start looking, especially at muscles of the back, you'll see that uh, different muscles, like the trapezius, in the very last 20 or 30 minutes of our day today, you'll see that it can do things like, um, as I stand here, pull your head back or raise your shoulder. Uh, and different ends of that muscle are working depending on whether we're locking down one end or locking down the other. And fixators help with that. They immobilize various points. Hey, we have a clicker question already, so let's see how you're doing. See if you're awake. We're on Channel D if you haven't joined me already. If you haven't, please join in. And you got a minute to handle that one. So it looks like 19 of you are with me now. Let's see where we go. Ah, coffee. You needed me to have more caffeine and sugar, didn't you? Let's get that timer thing out of the way. Waiting on four of you or whoever hadn't yet walked in the room. Break out your clicker, run channel, D sign in quick and answer this question. Terrified her. Can she make it? I can add more time. It's just fun to see if she gets there. Okay, well, there's another ten seconds. She's in. Waiting on that answer. Did you put your answer in? Yeah. Then one of these people didn't. I got 20 people and 19 answers. Who's? Uh, yeah, but she wouldn't be counted here if. Yeah, she's. We had 20 people who clicked in. Okay. Hey, most of you got it, but a couple of you had missed it. I got it right. Yay! And you didn't even hear me explain it. Those two people and somebody put in an invalid answer. Oh well. Off we go. Um, okay, skeletal muscles have interesting names. You'll hear today uh, names like the digastric or the biceps or the... Uh, things are falling all around me. Um, levator labii superioris or um, rhomboidus major or deltoid or uh, gastrocnemius. And a lot of times these muscles have very descriptive names. For instance... A muscle like sternocleidomastoideus. Um, that name actually very accurately describes exactly where you can find it. So these names have a lot of meaning for any of several different reasons. And you need, and we're going to go through a lot of it today, you need to start tearing apart their names and figuring out, frankly, what the hell they mean. Uh, a lot of them are named for where in the body you can find these muscles. Um, so what bone or body region are associated with the muscle? The one that I named a minute ago, sternocleidomastoideus, uh, has uh, three parts to its name. Sterno, which tells you one place it's attached, which would be anybody who care to guess? Sternum. Uh, we'll skip the clido in the middle for a minute. Uh, oh, this is just so wrong. Um, sterno, clido, we're going to skip. Mastoideus. Um, mastoideus tells you that it's attached to the... Anybody care to guess on that one? Yeah, mastoid process. And the one in the middle that I wasn't willing to show you there, Clido tells you it's attached to the, hmm? Clavicle. 
Clavicle, absolutely. So it's attached to the mastoid process and then to two spots down here, the sternum and the clavicle. And that one happens to be right here. And if you hold your hand behind that bump behind your ear and then uh, rock your head over to one side and over to the other, and then maybe turn it side to side, you can feel this muscle bunching up. It's a big, thick, strap-like muscle. So very often, they're named based on where they are. Shape is another good way to name muscles. The deltoid is delta-shaped, and uh, delta basically is a triangle. This is a triangular-shaped muscle uh, on your shoulder. Uh, relative size, how big is it compared to other things? Uh, you and I, in our very, very first week together, looked at, pardon the expression, butt cheeks, uh, and we looked at gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Maximus is the big one, medius is the mid-sized one, and minimus is the little one. So often muscles are named based on their relative size, commonly compared to each other. We'll look today at the rhomboidius major and minor, and you can probably figure out which is the bigger of those two. Uh, they're also often described in, by the direction of fibers or fascicles. What that really, really comes down to in as plain speak as I can possibly say it, is the direction of the grain of the meat. Uh, and there's a reality check for you. In case it never did click in your mind, muscles are meat. When you eat meat from animals, you're eating their muscles. I, I know most of you probably realize that, but I promise you one or two people in the room really never quite made that connection, but it's true. And as you look at the grain of the muscle, that's the direction of muscle fibers or fascicles in that muscle, and the direction is often telling. It tells you something about it. Rectus means they run straight. Tra transversus means they go uh, kind of across, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. It would be a great example. Oblique means they're at an angle. Um, and... When you're looking at muscles today, and I'll point it out several times on the camera, uh, you're going to be looking for the direction of the grain of the meat, and it will help you enormously to identify them. We're still looking at ways we name muscle, uh, and one of the ways we name muscle is based on the number of origins, or in some cases, some books will describe this as the number of heads. Um, the biceps has two heads, or two origins, the triceps has three heads or three origins. We can also name muscles based on where their attachments are. Um, levator scapula is attached on the scapula. Hey, and that's actually a good example of action. Uh, levator scapula levitates or lifts the scapula. Uh, flexors flex a joint, extensors extend a joint. Uh, and so now you've got kind of at least a ballpark uh, set of ways that muscle names might be chosen. Now, not every muscle uses every one of these, maybe not always get the number of origins or where they're attached or what they do, but that's very typically how any given name is derived from one or more of those uh, possible choices. Um, we did those. Now, the arrangement of fascicles in a muscle uh, is worth taking a look at because it tells you about how the muscle works. And again, what you need to realize when you look at the direction of the fascicles, the direction of the grain and the meat, what you need to start thinking of is, hey, okay, I've got a set of fibers running down the length of a muscle. What would happen if those fibers suddenly shortened? What's going to happen to the overall shape of the muscle? It's going to get shorter in that direction. So if you've got fibers that are circular, arranged in a circle, and by the way, these are sometimes called sphincters, Yet when it closes, it closes the hole. Uh, and I, I have an example, and I'm going to try my very best to use this example, but I understand I'm speaking to an entire class of utter, pure innocence. So you really probably won't get the example, but I'll throw it out there anyway. It's kind of like the top of a Crown Royal bag, which I know you've never touched, I know you've never seen, that drawstring on the top of a Crown Royal bag, and I really did lose one of you. Uh, it's that drawstring bag top that holds a bottle of some fancy alcohol, well, pseudo-fancy anyway, and when you pull on the strings, what happens to the hole? Closes and goes, see, all of you knew that. Most of you knew that. Uh, you, don't tell me you have one out in the car, I don't want to hear it. Uh, here we see 
around this eye a circular muscle called the orbicularis, oops, I bumped it, the orbicularis oculi, and it is one of these circular muscles, happens to be around an eye, and if you were to close that circle, uh, you would blink. Stop jumping my camera around. That's going to be as close as we're going to get. There's also one around the mouth called the orbicularis oris, kind of a puckering kind of muscle. There are also sphincter muscles other places. Some muscle fibers are convergent where the fascicles, the bundles of cells, all converge toward a single tendon insertion. The pectoralis major does that, although I'm not going to show you pectoralis major right now. Instead, I want to pull up on our camera the um, deltoid. It's on the shoulder. And as we look at this arm muscle here, I'm going to take the deltoid off the shoulder. You can kind of see that it's triangular shape. And you can also see that the fibers all kind of point down toward the bottom in a V. And this white bit on the bottom would be the tendon where this thing attaches down on the humerus. And this entire big fan focuses its pulling point right here on this tiny little spot. So you get an enormous amount of pull on a tiny little spot in a muscle that has convergent fiber arrangement. So it's a way of concentrating the power of the pull. Um, some muscles have fascicles or bundles of cells that are arranged parallel to each other. These tend to be long strap-like muscles. And the sartorius is a good example of that. I'll let you find out later on exactly where the sartorius is. Some muscles are fusiform, where they are thin, thick, thin. So in other words, they're fat in the middle and they taper on either end. And a great example of a muscle like that is the biceps brachii, the biceps of the uh, arm. And as I zoom in on the arm here, we can see the biceps brachii, which I will take off the arm. And you can see that it is fat in the middle and skinny out on either end. Now, this one happens to have two heads, which is why we call it the biceps, but it's kind of fat in the middle. By the way, on most muscles, this fat middle area is referred to as the belly um, it's because it's kind of a little chubby Buddha belly type area. And that Buddha belly, that uh, belly of the muscle, is where most of the pull tends to happen. Um, so that's a fusiform shape. Pennate. This name or this word means feather like. The short fascicles are arranged kind of at an angle to a central tendon. And we have really several possible types here. So let me show you in a little bit of sketching. A central tendon, and I'm actually going to do a few of these. Central tendon, and we'll start with the one on the left, and I'm going to call this one unipennate. And it would be a, have you ever pulled into a parking lot, like maybe the grocery store? and seen a row with a bunch of parking spaces all at an angle. Do you know why they do that? It's easier to pull in, but there's also more room. You fit more cars there. Now, the whole easier to pull in really doesn't apply much to muscle fibers because they're stuck there forever. It is easier to pull a car into an angle spot. But the bigger issue is you can fit more cars into spaces like this. You can fit more muscle fibers into a spot like this. So, again, stop and think. Anytime you see muscle fibers, what would happen if those fibers got shorter? What would happen if those red lines got shorter? We're tugging down here on this end. Now, you sacrifice something with this fiber arrangement. You can't pull, and this is all going to move, by the way, this way when those fibers tighten. Does that make sense? But when those fibers tighten, you're not going to move that bottom end down by the bottom of my blue arrow as much as if they were all lined up up and down instead of uh, being kind of off at an angle, but you have more power. So these are strong, but they don't move things as far. Now, the next shape I want to show you is bipennate. It actually looks a little bit more like a real feather. You've got fibers going off to the right and the left and the right and the left and the right and the left, and it is kind of feather shape, and we would call this shape bipennate. And again, we're tugging on the very bottom, 
and that very bottom of that yellow central tendon would be pulled that way if those fibers tugged. And when you have fibers arranged on both sides, you can tug a lot of power, but you don't move very far. So a very strong but a short distance pull. On the far right-hand side now, what I want to draw you is actually referred to as multi-pinnate. And it looks for all the world like a bird wing where you've got several feathers all together. I'm going to be kind of sparse on how I draw these in because I don't want to be here forever drawing in muscle fascicles. But the point there is we're concentrating all of our pull down at that very bottom tip where all of these merged tendons meet. So again, we're pulling that way. And the deltoid that I showed you a couple minutes ago is one of these. So this muscle right here is uh, basically there's a feather shape, there's another feather shape there, there's another feather shape over here, and they all kind of collectively together are pulling on that one little spot right there. You get an enormous amount of pull with a muscle like that. So unipinnate, bipinnate, multipinnate, and here's some of those shapes we've looked at. we got circular in the top corner up there, a good example would be the orbicularis oris. Then we have a parallel, this is often called a strap muscle, uh, and the sartorius uh, in the upper part of the thigh, it works like this. Uh, across the bottom, we've got a bipinnate, and a great example of that is the rectus femoris. That's one of your uh, leg, uh, thigh muscles. We have a fusiform, kind of fat in the middle, tapered on either end. The biceps break is a good example of that. This one is a multipinnate, kind of like several feathers all put together, and that's the deltoid. Unipinnate. You can see we've got this one uh, central tendon on the right side of this particular example, and the muscle fibers extending off to the right side, the left side on this picture, uh, and that would be the extensor digitorum longus, and the convergent example would be the pectoralis major. So these are some various shapes of muscles you might see. All right, it's hard really to talk about how muscles work without talking about the mechanics of what they do in terms of lever systems. Uh, this is kind of my moment to stop and teach you a little bit of simple physics. Uh, if you've never bothered in a science class to study how levers work, there's not just one type of lever. There's really several major classes of levers, and we're going to look at class one, class two, and class three levers today. But before we do that, I've got to tell you the parts we're going to deal with. The first part we're going to deal with is the lever itself. It's a rigid bar that moves around a fixed point or fulcrum. And really the simplest way to start this discussion is to remind you of your playground days when you were playing on that uh, playground toy that you either called a teeter-totter or a seesaw. And I don't know which one you called it, but you probably called it one of those two things. You've got a board generally balanced on a pipe held in place with some U-bolts uh, and a uh, pair of hopefully relatively equal-sized kids on either side of the board setting down. Been there before? Okay. And that example... The board is the lever. The fulcrum is the pipe in the middle that this all balances on. The load would be the child going up, and the effort is the child going down. And there's several ways to look at that. The big advantage to levers is you get a mechanical advantage. One of the most... Um, classic statements in, in history was the comment that give me a lever and I can move the world given the right place to stand because you get an enormous mechanical advantage with uh, levers of various kinds. Some give you different types of advantage and we'll talk about that along the way. Uh, I have with me in the room a uh, kind of a broken broom handle here that makes a really good demo and I may even get the camera out here in a little bit. You know what? What the hell? Just get the camera out and show me being a fool which doesn't take much effort sometimes for the people on integrity. Oh, what I do for you. Um, okay, that's probably enough visual area for us to work with. We have um, a chair. And I'll move a table out of the way. And I'll insert that uh, handle in behind the chair. Now, Watch my right hand. Can you see that on screen? You can. This works. Uh, my left hand is going to go in the middle of the stick, 
and I'm going to push down with my right hand, hopefully leaving my left hand relatively where it is, and then the chair should go up. So I would ask you, A, what is the lever in this equation? Broomstick. What's going to play the role of the fulcrum? My, my hand is the right answer. Which hand? Left. What's going to provide the effort? Right hand, and what's the load in this case? The chair. Works for me, and here we go. I push down, and as I push down with my right hand, keeping my left hand stable, the chair gets lifted, and now I've got to put it down without breaking something here. So there we go. That's an example of a lever, and without the chair, this works a little bit easier. I push down with my right hand, and the end of the stick, which has some weight to it, goes up. My left hand stays pretty much put, and this is one of three classes of lever. And you can figure out in a minute which class of lever that was. So back here we go. The first class lever, the first type we're going to talk about, has the fulcrum, the pivot point, between the load and the effort. Um, the author gave us two examples. One's kind of the teeter-totter. Uh, and one is the scissor, and these are both examples of first-class levers. So that actually was what I was doing with that stick. My pivot point, the fulcrum, was in the middle, my left hand. The effort was on the other end of the stick with the load on the far end of the stick. And the real-world example is a pair of scissors. Frankly, I like the shovel as a better example, and it kind of works. Now, we also need an anatomical example of this. Where in the body do we find a first excuse me, a first-class lever, and that would be where your atlas meets your skull. And if you tighten the muscles at the back of your neck, what happens to your face? It goes up, and you look at the ceiling. And that is an anatomical example of a first-class lever. The load, in this case, is the weight of your face that wants to pull you back down when you're actually turning your head up. Second-class levers, in these, the load that's being lifted is between the fulcrum and the effort. Um, I love, love, love this as an example. The wheelbarrow makes a great example. Where do you grab this and lift? The handle. Where's the pivoting happening? The axle of the wheel. And the load that's being lifted is between that pivot point and you pull in on the handle, right? Okay, where in the body would you find this? When you stand on tiptoes. The fulcrum is the ball of your foot. The effort would be the muscles in your calf, and what weight is being lifted when you do that? Your body weight, pretty much everything above your ankle. And I've got to tell you, it's weird as hell doing tiptoes in cowboy boots, but hey, it works. Um, okay, third class levers, the other major type we need to talk about, has the effort, the pull, being applied between the pivot point and the load. This one is a tiny bit more difficult, but it's easy enough to understand. Uh, the, the tweezers make an interesting example. Uh, this is kind of a weird arrangement out in the world. If you look at that very top example up here, you're kind of thinking, well, why would you ever want to do that? Put a balance point, and then you grab it and lift, and there's a weight out in front. And the best way to really envision this is something like lifting a set of uh, weights. The attachment point for the muscles that are doing this are up on the shoulder or on the arm. When those get shorter, they're attached down here on the forearm. And where's the joint? The joint is the elbow itself. Well, that pull is out in front of that joint. The weight is being lifted up. Not, I kind of hate that they're showing you that gray arrow going down. The weight wants to pull it down. What are you actually doing with that weight, though? You're actually lifting it up. So when you tighten the muscles of your upper arm, the attachment point is an inch or two out on your forearm. And as you lift, that pivot point is back behind the pull. So this is a third class lever. And a perfect example of that is the way the elbow works. All right. We're going to start looking at major muscles of the body kind of from here on out. And move some of this stuff back into place because I don't need all these bits and pieces hanging around. Uh, we still have other things to, to deal with here in a great way to learn muscles. And I told you already uh, some of this a few minutes ago is uh, what I often call OIA for the people on integrity. This is origin. 
insertion, action. If you know the name of the muscle, where it attaches, that doesn't move, where it attaches, that does move, and what it happens when it moves, then frankly, you know everything about the muscle with the single maybe exception of what nerve caused it to do that. So as you're studying, this is a great strategy. If you kind of recite this, and this is a great way to make some note cards, the name of the muscle, where it attaches, where it attaches, and what happens when it moves, then you know that muscle cold. Um, so name a description. Origin and insertion, action, and then innervation. Now, you'll hear, and we'll see several videos as we go through the day today, you'll hear several uh, examples where they tell you what nerve innervates this. There are a few that I want you to know, but I wouldn't memorize absolutely every single nerve, especially around the face. I'm going to want you to know some of those. Uh, I'll tell you some cranial nerves around the face that innervate various things, and, and be sure you know those. When we get out into the body, I'm not going to worry as much about the, which nerve innervates which muscle along the way, because at some point, we've got to draw the line somewhere, because we only have about a week and a half left to learn all this stuff, and at some point, we kind of got to squeeze the material a little bit, um, but not a whole lot. But if you approach learning any given muscle this way, you'll get it especially the name and description, origin, insertion, and action, OIA, is an outstanding way to learn muscles. And here's kind of where we're going over the next uh, three days together. We've got the head muscles, which includes some facial muscles. We've got shoulder muscles, arm muscles, forearm muscles, pelvis and thigh, some strict thigh muscles, some leg muscles down below the knee. We have some muscles in the neck. We've got some muscles in the chest. We've got some muscles in the abdomen, the thigh the leg, and if we spin this guy around, we've got more from some of these same areas from behind. And I'm not going to go over all of those in this picture because we're going to see most, if not all, of these listed over the next coming pages. So here we go. We're going to start in the head where we're going to find two major groups of muscles that we'll be spending time with for the next, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. We'll look at first muscles of facial expression. These are interesting and kind of unique because this is one of the main groups of muscles in the body where we do not have one muscle anchored to a bone and pulling on a bone. You know, if you're looking at the uh, sets of muscles that tug the elbow around, flex and straighten the elbow, we're attached to the shoulder, we're attached to the forearm, and we flex. And one bone moves against another. But on the face, that's not true. On the face, we've got a set of muscles that are attached to a bone and attached to skin because you're moving around parts of your face which are not made of bone, they're made of skin. Uh, and we also, as we look at muscles of the head, we'll look at the other group that are dedicated to moving around the tongue and to chewing. The word mastication means to chew. So we'll look at some chewing muscles. You have muscles that help you to open your jaw, help you close your jaw, and that help you move your jaw side to side. And we'll be looking at those as we go through the day today. Um, muscles of facial expression first. Again, these are unique uh, somewhat in that they insert on the skin. Their origins are on bones of the skull. And whenever they move, they move around pieces of skin to um, give you different facial expressions. And they are critically important in nonverbal communication. Now. For whatever reason, this sometimes escapes the immediate understanding of sort of the general public. Um, how many times, and you don't have to show up your hand, you don't have to hold your hands, you don't have to give me a count of three, five, seventeen. Uh, how many times, just kind of think in your own mind, how many times in your life have you been confused by text-based communication, email or SMS messages, where... You maybe thought something was funny when you sent it, and the person who got it was offended or had their feelings hurt. Or you got a message, and you thought, well, that was just rude. And the other person really was only joking, and it was kind of said in a lighthearted way. And you don't get that kind of emotional content just from reading text. When you're dealing with people face-to-face, -face, you see what their faces are doing. You kind of see the uh, general body posture. Uh, you see the sparkle in their eye and the kind of the joking way they say it. And that's all part of nonverbal communication. And that is, uh, frankly, about 60% of face-to-face com -face communication is what is not said.
compared to what is said. So this facial expression is very much important to humans. And all of this facial expression stuff is a group of muscles that are controlled by one single nerve. Uh, it's called the facial nerve. And when we get around in January to looking at the cranial nerves, you're going to learn at that point. You might as well know it now because I'm going to ask you probably on the test. This is cranial nerve number seven. The nerves on the underside of your brain, the cranial nerves, have numbers from front to back, mostly. And this, this one happens to be number seven, the facial nerve. So all of these that have to do with smiling, frowning, uh, blinking, all are innervated by facial nerve. We're going to look at a few of these muscles. One of them is called, um, you know, I'm not going to disagree with her, but I will say that this is not the most common term for that. The most common term for this muscle we're about to look at is the occipitofrontalis, and it actually is a two-part muscle. It is a two part muscle. And the two parts of the muscle are called the frontalis and the occipitalis, which is why a lot of times people are going to just call this the occipitofrontalis muscle. Occipital in the back, frontalis in front. <coughs> and as you look at our half-head model, you know what, I think I want to set these guys off on the floor and move our stand and the camera over to where I can get to it easily and show you this stuff without too much moving around. Half head comes here, camera comes up, and here we have on our half head the occipitalis in the back, the frontalis, this basically your forehead muscle, and they're connected by this big sheet of white connective tissue over the top of the non-muscular part of the top of the head, which is an aponeurosis. Uh, an aponeurosis, a big flat wide tendon. So that flat wide tendon happens to be called the gallia aponeurotica, yay fancy name. And these two muscles have the uh, job of pulling your scalp forward and backward. And a lot of people have that weird uncle at the family reunion who once a year, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas, maybe in the summer at the reunion, uh, the weird uncle that can wiggle his scalp back and forth, usually he's a bald guy, or he's at least got that little horseshoe of hair around the side, and you can see the scalp go, uh, 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 and it's just weird. These are the two muscles that do that. This one tugs it forward, this one tugs it back. Do, 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 do. And this would be, again, the frontalis. This is the occipitalis, and this up here is the aponeurotica, the gallia aponeurotica. Um, again, more muscles which we will spend some time with, we have uh, the circle around the eye. That's the orbicularis oculi. We have one of my very favorite muscle names. This is the elbus lip lifting muscle, the levator labii superioris. It's the ugly sounding name, but hey, look at it. What does the word levator mean? It lifts. Labii superioris. Top lift. It lifts your top lift. So this is the kind of a sneering muscle. Uh, continuing on around, uh, this here, and this is actually not the best picture of this muscle. It actually kind of continues as a sheet down here. This is a muscle called the buccinator. I've also heard it pronounced buccinator. And if you happen to be a Scrabble or a crossword puzzle fan, you may or may not recognize this word. Does anybody know what the word bus with two S's means? Really? Holy moly. This one, whenever you tighten it, helps keep food between your teeth. That is the buccinator. Another favorite of mine on this page, and we'll look at a lot of these as we go through here, is the platissima. It's a big, wide sheet of muscle that makes up the, uh, some of the most superficial layers on the front of the neck. And this is one of the favorites of my youngest son, Evan. Every time he sees me, one of his first questions is, Daddy, do the turtle face. Right there. So that's a platissima. Uh, depressor anguli oris. What would depressor mean? 
depressor pull down angularly, angle or corner, orus, pulls the corner of your mouth. This is a frowning muscle. Depressor anguli or pulls down the corner of the mouth. Can you get any more descriptive than that? Really, I can't imagine it. Part, yeah, there you go. Or you, if you're depressed, you're frowning. There's a little corner here, not a little corner, but a little V-shaped muscle here called the mentalis. Um, this one shows up really, really well on our half-head model. Uh, it is, let me see if I can get this picture to turn up here, right in the very front, right here, tiny little strap, and that little strap forms a V. If we had both sides here, you could see that there's a little V there, and some people have a mentalis muscle that is so prominent, they've actually got a little chin butt, the little cleft in the chin. Uh, around the side here, we've got a couple of muscles involved in chewing. This one, which I'll color in blue, is the masseter. And what I would like you to do here is to um, put your hand on the corner of your jaw and then just bite, clench your teeth, really, not really, I mean, don't bang your teeth together, but clench them together kind of hard. Feel the bulge there? That bulge is uh, the masseter bulging. Now, put your hand above the side of your head. Do the same little tooth clenching thing. You feel the, the bulging of the muscle right above your ear? Right above your ear is where you want to feel that. Okay, there's a cool little thing that goes along with that. Um, you remember, and by the way, we're looking at uh, this muscle right here. You remember when I was talking in our bone chapter about any time you exercise a muscle, you make the muscle bigger, and as a result, the, I probably ought to move my hand, I'll make you crazy. Uh, you exercise the, the muscle, and as the muscle grows, the bone grows, right? Well, I want to tell you a really interesting story about a skull that was found in northern Alaska uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and it happened to be an adult human female skull. You know, nice smooth brow ridges, a sharp orbital rim. The occipital area was nice and smooth, no obvious bumps on it. Um, and, you know, in all respects, it looked like a normal human adult female skull. Yay! With one weird exception. And the weird exception was, 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 hmm? No, this is not the skull. This is not the skull at all. But this skull has a feature that you've got to kind of do a little mental... Photoshop, can you take one feature off this skull and merge it onto that skull? Again, normal human, fairly cute female skull, except for the hole in her head. Uh, nice and smooth, even brow ridges. But I want you to add to her a ridge on the top of the skull, like a fin. You see that? It's called a sagittal crest. Now, this is a weird one. This actually is a pre-human uh, really not even an ancestor. This is not the skull that was found in northern Alaska, but it happens to have this crest of bone that was on the otherwise healthy, normal female skull, right? So it looks like uh, the anthropologist who found this has found a missing link, and that's kind of what they were thinking back when they first found it. Hey, we got a normal human skull with a ridge on the top. This is just freaking weird. Maybe it's some crazy ancestor. We don't know what we found. So this skull actually hung around and was part of debates for several decades. And again, it did not look like this. This is actually happens to be Australopithecus boisei, which is a side line. This individual was never part of human uh, ancestry, but it had this same kind of weird spiky crest on it. Well, this goes back to something that I told you kind of, oh, a month or so ago. When you exercise muscle, the bone it's attached to gets bigger right along with the muscle. So again, where did I tell you the skull was found? Alaska. Um, it's a prehistoric skull. So what group of people, before white people showed up, lived in northern Alaska? The Inuit, the Eskimos. What did they wear? Hmm? They had, they had, okay, okay, ho hoodies sort of works. What are the hoods made of? Fur. Fur. Fur actually is leather with the hair still on it, right? Okay. People are people, and people have been people for about 250,000 years, and they have the same sort of quirks 
uh, a thousand years ago that you and I have now. One thing that makes me absolutely crazy is tags in the back of my shirt. They itch and they make me wacko. And the same was true 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And this skull was a female human skull. Let's just run. Let's get off that because the camera's making me crazy now. This skull was a human female skull. Screen's black on purpose, integrity people. And what was going on was this was a lady who had spent much of her life tending her family, taking care of her family, her husband, her sons, her daughters, and she spent most of her nights. Oh, again, the clothes were made of what again? Leather, call it leather. There's hair on it in its fur, so yay. But she sat around the fire most of her nights. You know how do you make leather soft and supple? Rub it kind of works, but it still doesn't help. You get a really tough, itchy part of a collar that I promise you a husband's going to bitch about. You chew it, sitting around the fire in the night, kind of having family talk, and mom's chewing on the collars to make them soft. And if you gnaw on fur for, I don't know, 40, 50 years, you really get very strong jaw muscles. And this lady's skull had chewed so much that her jaw muscles on the side of her head, the temporalis in particular, had actually pulled a ridge of bone on the top of her skull. Her skull had grown so stout to support this very heavy jaw muscle that she had a ridge of bone. She was a lady that you frankly would never want to piss off because if she bit you, it would hurt. Uh, that same saying is true for dogs that have particularly heavy crests. You've seen them running down the top of their head. Those dogs have a massive amount of jaw power. Don't let them bite you. So it's a great example of form follows function. If you use a muscle extensively, the bone around it will build up. And that one certainly did. And that muscle we just looked at over your ears is the temporalis. And it sets in a little shallow spot called the temporal fossa. And yeah, we'll get that in a little bit. Okay. Muscles moving the tongue. Muscles moving the tongue and muscles that are involved in chewing come in uh, four pairs. I'm trying to get that up and out of the way. The four pairs of muscles involved in chewing mastication. We have the prime movers of closing the jaw, the temporalis and the master, which we just looked at. I did have you hold your hands over your ears and do that little squinchy thing, didn't I? Yay. Okay, thought so. Grinding motion, side to side grinding. Because you know you do grind your jaws side to side. Those are the medial and the lateral pterygoid muscles. And you'll see pictures of most of these over the next few pages. Uh, these muscles involved in chewing and tongue moving are controlled by cranial nerve number five, which is called the trigeminal nerve. The bucinator or buccinator muscles also in the facial expression group, help by holding the food between the teeth. These basically are the main side panels, if you will, of your cheeks. If you kind of take your tongue and push it against the inside of your cheek, sort of poking your cheek out, and you're poking against your buccinator or bucinator. Uh, there's also three major muscles that anchor and move the tongue around, and those are all innervated by cranial nerve number 12, which is called the hypoglossal nerve. Pictures are coming up, and here we see some of those. Uh, these two muscles, the temporalis and the masseter, are the two main muscles that close your jaw. Uh, along the side, we have a picture of the buccinator or bucinator, and that's not the best picture of it. We'll see a really good picture in a video. And the orbicularis oris is this circular or sphincter-like muscle around the mouth. And when that one closes, you're kind of puckering your lips. Oh, clicker question. You know what? No, let's do this after a break. Yeah, it's close enough, and it'll give me a chance to see who comes back. Okay, we just got started. We had a clicker question, which the integrity people missed. Oh, that's so sad. But I had a question. When are the coloring books due? They're due the day you take your final. I'll take them any time between now and the day you take your final. But the day you're sitting in here looking at your test paper, struggling over those questions, I'll be up at the front grading your coloring books. And I'm very picky about how I want them turned in. I've already told you how I want them colored, right, where you're coloring all the words and all the things that have the same labels. But you've got, what is it, 1 through 69 or 1 through 70? 
1 through 69. What I want you to do is open that first page, the cover, and on the inside page, kind of draw a line down the middle of the page, realizing you and I have AMP1 and AMP2. And on the left side of that page, I want you to give me a list of the number of pages. Listen carefully. And if you're on integrity, you can replay this if you need to. It ain't a tough concept. I am not going to stand up here and, and turn pages. Page one colored, great, that's a quarter of a point. Then page two, then page three, then, damn it, they didn't do four. Okay, we had three. Skip four, skip five, skip six, skip seven. Oh, they did eight. That's five. No, that's four pages. Skip page nine, skip page ten, skip page eleven, did page twelve. Okay, now we're up to, I lost count. It makes me crazy, and I can't tell you how many books I've graded over the years that are like that. So you tell me how many pages you colored. If it's 1 through 12, and 16 through 21, and uh, 50 through 69, yay! And then you give me a total number of pages. Whatever that comes, if that's right, yay. If it's right, it's a freaking miracle because I just made a guess. But I want to know. And frankly, if you did them all, tell me. All. 69 pages. And then I'll come in and give you a grade. Don't make me flip through and see which ones were colored. Don't make me even count them. Give me the total number of pages and the pages you colored. Now, does that mean you can just write all 69 in the front and I'm going to look at that and say, yay? No, I'm going to flip through them and I'll flip through them randomly. And I'll stop on a few of the books and I'll actually count them. And if you lie to me, I'm going to keep every freaking point. So make sure you're honest and there you go. That's how it's going to work. Uh, it'll be really easy. It won't take me long to grade them, so you'll get them right after that. Now, you can turn these in early, but I'm not going to grade them until that day. I'm going to set up here in the front of the room and grade a big stack all at once. It's easier in my mindset to do that one task all at one time instead of 10 or 12 times between now and the day of the final. So I'll grade them all that day. If you're actually taking the final, then what you want to do is you want to turn in your test paper when you're done. Show me your clickers turned off, of course, like always, and take your book, and then you can go on. If you don't pick it up, then I'll keep it. And then when you come back and see me in January, uh, the book should still be here. The safest thing for you, since you paid for this book, is take it up the day you take the test. Uh, if not, that's okay. I'm going to keep them around, but it's always safer for you to take them. I have had occasion where uh, somebody comes back to see me mid-January on the first day of class and says, well, I need my coloring book back. Can you get it to me? And all I've got is a big stack. Uh, so I'm not really paying a whole lot of attention to who's taking which book, so be sure you take your own. A really, really good trick, by the way, is to take your book and write your name out on the edge of the book somewhere. It's easy to tell because they all look alike in the stack. Thank you for that. I'm so sorry. Um, it's easy to spot if you've got your name kind of written out on the edge. Be sure your name is written on there somewhere, though. And I told you that on the day that I signed it. Be sure your name is there because it's too easy for somebody to put their name on the book someplace. And I always, just a little tip, because these books are expensive. You guys paid a whole lot for your A&P book, right? I'll pick a random page that is always the same two or three page numbers myself, and I'll write my name or my initials on pages inside the book. Uh, it's not this, but if my habit happened to be 37, then I could always maybe flip over to page 37, and, and if my initials are there, I know somebody's got my book, because there's not a random TAA on 37 of Zach's book. You know, there'd be no point. So if you haven't learned that tip yet, it's kind of handy. Did you have a question? Um, you, you're not taking the final, you're not going to be in next semester. If you want to get it to me early, I'll get yours graded kind of individually, and I'll hand it back to you right after I grade it. If you do that business where you tell me how many pages on that front, it's easy to grade. I'll kind of flip through it and make sure it looks like most of that's done. I'll get the grade posted on D2, I'll hand it right back to you. That way you get it, you get your grade, and we're all good. Yes, ma'am? Pardon? Uh, yeah, on the inside cover. So, in fact, let me show the people integrity so they can see. Do you mind? Um, got a coloring book. Open it up. And here, on this blank thing right here, is where you want to do it. And again, draw a line down the center and do it over on the left side because we're going to do AMP2 on the other side. 
And that way, it's easy for me to grade. takes just a minute to get it done. I'll flip through, and if it looks like you didn't do it, then I'm not going to give you the points. And that's how it's going to work. Okay, let's get off with the rest of this, because we still have a lot of work to do today. Uh, we're going to take a look at several videos as we go through the day today. And the first we're going to look at is muscles involved in chewing. So we'll take a look at the temporalis. These are very short movies. They don't take long at all. And here we go. Why is that not making noise? We are plugged in. I know it's buzzing. Oh, don't do this to me. I need the audio. Well, that's just wrong. Oh, I know what happened. It always does this. This microphone stole our sound. Hang on. Let's pause Tegrity and fix it. Tegrity, we're, Tegrity, we're back with you. We're recording. This is our first movie about the temporalis muscle. The origin of the temporalis is from the temporal fossa. The insertions are to the coronoid process of the mandible and to the portion of the ramus below it. Temporalis closes the jaw. It is innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. Okay. As they did that, I want you to notice several things that you're going to get used to today as we watch these movies because there's a bunch of them. They're going to show you where it attaches, origin and insertion. Then they'll show you its movement. They'll tell you the name of this thing, of course. And then they'll uh, start with the opposite of the movement, in this case, opening the jaw, which this muscle does not do. And then they'll close it, which is the muscle that it actually does do. So usually they open it up and then they let it do its work. And then they'll tell you what nerve innervates it. And here in the face, I want you to know those nerve names. Masters next. The origins of masseter are from the medial surface of the maxilla and the medial surface and inferior border of the zygomatic arch. The insertions are to the lateral surfaces of the angle and ramus of the mandible. Masseter closes the jaw. It is innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. And one more on this page, the bucinator, or she's going to pronounce it buccinator. Uh, this is the, uh, the sides of the cheek, and it's involved in basically keeping food between your teeth as you're chewing. Or puckering up. The or origins of buccinator are from the posterior alveolar margins of the maxilla and mandible, and from a band of connective tissue running vertically between the two, known as the pterygomandibular raphe. At its insertion, buccinator blends with fibers of the orbicularis oris. Buccinator compresses the cheeks to hold food between the teeth while chewing. Or to do that... It's innervated by the facial nerve. Or to do that silly fish face move. Next we have pictures kind of showing some of these. These are lateral pterygoids. Oops, get back here. Lateral pterygoids over here, medial pterygoid down here. And these are involved in the side-to-side -side, uh, grinding motion of your teeth. The masseter has been pulled out of the way so you can see those. So these are deep to the jaw, deep to the masseter. In this particular picture, we see three major muscles involved in moving the tongue around. Uh, this one, the three that you're looking at on this page are highlighted in bold. This one is the styloglossus. By the way, gloss is tongue. And there's the styloglossus. Down here we have the genioglossus. And back in here, let's go red on this one. We have the hyal that didn't turn red. Hyaloglossus. And we have one head model that really, really well shows these. I left it in the other room, so give me just a second to grab this one, because those stand out really well on the Anna head. The, uh, of course, I said it already, the word stylo, or the word glossus means tongue. Stylo refers to the styloid process, the spike of bone on the back of the skull. 
the hyoglossus attaches to the hyoid bone, and genoglossus attaches to the inside of the chin. And as you look at the ana head, which the camera is about to point to, you're going to see these very, very well. Oh, come on. Got it. All right, in this model, let's see if I can get the camera to stop moving on its own wire. This one is the styloglossus, this one is the genioglossus, and this one right here is the uh, hyoglossus. And again, you want to pay attention to the direction of the fibers as they are uh, visible here. So these fibers are going up like this, these fibers are moving like this, and these fibers are back here. And again, our timer gets in our way, so let me get those out of the way. We'll look at some of these other muscles that are labeled a little bit later on. Uh, muscles that are in the front part of the neck and the throat come in two groups. Some are above the hyoid bone and some are below the hyoid bone. Any guesses what the suprahyoid would be? Above and infra is down below. The word infra, by the way, means beneath, and you're going to see it a few times today. Uh, there are uh, four deep muscles in the front part of the neck and the throat that are uh, involved in swallowing. They make up the floor of the mouth. And if you ever have hooked your fingers together like a C-shape and put them inside your jaw and kind of grabbed your mouth like a fish hook, uh, you're, gra you're grabbing onto some of these in that particular move. They make up the floor of the mouth. They anchor the tongue in place, and they move the hyoid bone up and down as you swallow. The muscles that are beneath the hyoid bone, the infrahyoid muscles, make up the front part of the neck and the throat. They're strap-like muscles that push down on the hyoid or tug it back down as you're swallowing and while you're speaking. And in this picture, we can see those, and I'll do some highlighting on these. This one here is a big sheet called the mylohyoid, and it basically is the floor of the mouth. Off to the side, we have one called the stylohyoid, and the stylohyoid attaches to the styloid process on the base of the skull, and the hyoid bone. So the names are very indicative of where you find them. Uh, there's also a pair of muscles. Really, it's one muscle that is a pair called the digastric. Di is how many? Gastric refers to anybody care to guess? Stomach or bellies? So here's a belly in the front. Here's a belly in the back. These are the anterior and posterior bellies of the digastric muscle, and this muscle, or these pairs of muscles, are easy to see. And again, I'm going to take you to the anuscul very quickly. Come on, I need that right there. Looking at the anuscul and turning her this way, this is a, a view at the bottom of her chin. Stop spinning. And in this model, you can see the... Uh, that sheet that forms the bottom of the skull, that would be the uh, mylohyoid, is right there. This is the back, uh, sorry, this is the front belly of the digastric. This is the back belly of the digastric. And this muscle right here, the stylohyoid. And the focus is just not playing nicely with me on that one. There we go. It's attached to the hyoid down here and the styloid process up there. So stylohyoid, the posterior belly and the anterior belly of the double stomach, double belly, digastric muscle right there. You can also see these in the half head model, and it might actually be easier for our camera to focus on as I move the half head here and ask the camera to look up. Two bellies, front belly, back belly, and then we have the uh, stylohyoid muscle in the back. So these are really, frankly, pretty easy to see when you start looking for them. Uh, on this picture, we can also see the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's attached to the mastoid process back here, and it actually has a front part that comes down and attaches to the sternum. You see that? And it also comes down here and attaches along the clavicle. So we have the sternocleidomastoid with those three features. Um, we also have, as we move in just a little bit, these two pairs here is the sternohyoid. What's it attached to on the bottom? Sternum. What's it attached to on the top? Hyoid bone. I love how those names work. And if we go a little bit lateral from that, that strap is the omohyoid. And you can see these really, really well 
on our half head. Again, let me jump back to the camera, tilt it down a little bit. See the big old massive strap here? This is the sternocleidomastoid attaching to the sternum in the front, the clavicle back here. But look right here, this one and this one, medial and lateral. You see those, the, the groove down the middle? The one that's more medial, that would be sternohyoid, which I've colored in blue here. The one that's a little more lateral is the omohyoid. And as you go back to the uh, camera, they're easy to spot here and here, omohyoid, sternohyoid. Um, frankly, I'm not sure. I'd have to go double check. Keep in mind, I'm a nerve guy, not a muscle guy. All right. Again, I'm not going to show you every single one of these, but go down the list in your lab book, uh, and it shows you the ones you need to learn. And as we look at this side view, we have a few more. There's another picture of the buccinator, uh, and we also have a few others here, but I'm mostly going to go on to this set of pages where we have kind of, if you need to study these at home, uh, our rotatable half-head model, which we've kind of seen before. And as you just watch it play, it spins around. You can pause it at any point in time. You can grab this thing and scroll forward or backward. And we also have this one, which is, frankly, this top button is just scary and odd. This looks like some evil convict pickled his face and chopped it open to stare at you. Like, Ugh! Or something out of some horror movie, but uh, there you go. And it does very nicely show most of these muscles we're talking about on the face. You can see uh, several of the facial muscles very well in that model. Uh, muscles that move the neck and the vertebral column come in two big groups. We have muscles that move the head, and then we have muscles that extend the trunk and help to maintain posture, and we're going there next. Sternocleidomastoid, I've shown you a few times already, is a major head flexor. Stop it, Austin. I was going for a highlighter, and it, boy, did not work. Get back. Supra, it's supposed to be a highlighter. Suprahyoid or above the hyoid, infrahyoid or below these, and those are synergists that help to flex the head. Sternocleidomastoid and scalenes handle lateral head movements, moving your head off to the side. Semispinalis capitis work together with sternocleidomastoid, and the splenius, including splenius capitis and splenius cervicis, uh, extend the head, rotate the head, and laterally bend the head. Now, get used to these because you're going to see these two terms a lot over the next 30 minutes. The word capitus means head, and the word cervicis means anybody care to guess? Neck, yes. And you'll see those two terms in relation to several different muscles. Here we see uh, in an anterior view, Lord, we keep coming back to sternocleidomastoid. The author really likes that book, and frankly, so do I. Here are some scalene muscles. These are deep neck muscles. We've got middle scalenes, we've got anterior scalenes, and we've got posterior scalenes deep in the neck, attaching on the first and second ribs. Uh, here on the back view is a very large, fairly deep neck muscle called the splenius capitis. If you run your fingers along the base of the back of your skull, you can feel a spot where some muscles attach, especially if you rock your head. And several of those that you're feeling include the splenius capitis. Uh, we have a couple of videos here to watch, so let's do that now. The origins of splenius capitis are from the inferior path of the ligamentum nuchae and the spinous processes of C7 through T3. The insertions are to the mastoid process of the temple bone and the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone. Acting bilaterally, the splenius capitis extends the head and neck. Acting unilaterally, it extends and laterally flexes and rotates the head and neck to the same side. It is innervated by the dorsal rami of the cervical spinal nerves. I'm going to kind of jump out of this when they start talking about nerves because I'm not as concerned about you knowing the names of the nerve here in the neck or the back. Here's the semi. The semispinatus muscles form the first layer of the deep muscles of the back. There are three parts. Semispinatus thoracis, semispinatus cervicis, and semispinatus capitis. I told you you'd see those, and you're going to see them again. Thoracis for chest or thorax services for necks and capitis for the head.
The origins of the semispinalis capitis are from the tips of the transverse processes of T6 through C7 and the articular processes of C6 through C4. The insertion is to the occipital bone between the superior and inferior nuchal lines. Acting bilaterally, the semispinalis capitis extends the head and neck. Acting unilaterally, the semispinalis capitis rotates the head to the opposite side. What I would suggest as you watch these movies, if you'll kind of make the same motions they're doing, you can feel these muscles moving deep in your body and you kind of uh, uh, get a feel for where they are. It is enervated by the posterior rami of the cervical spinal nerves. The semispinatus muscles form the... I just did that, didn't I? Sorry. Sometimes these get ahead of me. Okay, we're still in the neck, we're in the vertebrae, and we're going to deal with muscles that extend the trunk. Uh, these are deep back muscles, and they come in several groups. We'll look at iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. This is three bundles that kind of move from the side toward the middle, and they're involved in back extension and lateral bending. And the videos really show them very, very nicely. We have, again, three groups. One group is uh, more lateral. The next group is a little more medial. And the next group is very medial, kind of like right up against the spine. So here we go with this group of three. And you're going to hear a lot of the same stuff said over and over and over again. The erector spinae, the prime movers of back... See all three bundles? One on the very far side, kind of middle, and then right up against the spine. Here we go. Back extension consists of three superficial columns of muscle in the posterior neck and trunk. These are the iliocostalis, the longissimus, and the spinalis. The iliocostalis forms the lateral column, and like the others, it has three parts. These are iliocostalis lumborum, iliocostalis thoracis, and iliocostalis surfaces. From their origins, iliocostalis fibers run superiorly to insert onto parts of the vertebrae and ribs. The origins are from the sacrum. The spinous processes of vertebrae L5 through T11, the iliac crest, and from the angle of ribs 12 through 3. The insertions are to the angle of ribs 12 through 1, and the transverse processes of C7 through C4. Acting bilaterally, the iliocostalis extends the vertebral column and neck. Acting unilaterally, the iliocostalis thoracis laterally flexes the vertebral column to the same side. It is enervated by the dorsal rami of spinal nerves. Now, that was iliocostalis. Here's the longissimus, and their name tells you that they're very long muscles. By the way, as you look at these... The spiny, the prime hush. As you look at these, we've already done the outside group. We're moving toward the inside now. And these, if you were a hunter and you were butchering an animal that you had killed to eat, these are sometimes referred to as backstrap muscles. And they are good. We're in the middle now. Movers of back extension consist of three superficial columns of muscle in the posterior neck and trunk. These are the iliocostalis. Which we've done. The longissimus. Which we're doing now. And the spinalis. Which, frankly, we're not going to do because I'm getting bored. The longissimus forms the middle column, and like the others, it has three parts. These are longissimus thoracis. Longissimus cervices and longissimus capitis. From their origins, longissimus fibers run superiorly to insert onto parts of the vertebrae and skull. The origins are from the thoracolumbar fascia, the transverse processes of L4 through L1, and T5 through T1, as well as the articular processes of C7 through C4. The insertions are to the transverse processes of T12 through T1 and C6 through C2 to ribs 12 through 4 between the angle and the tubercle and to the posterior margin of the mastoid process of the temporal bone. 
Acting bilaterally, the longissimus extends the vertebral column and neck. Acting unilaterally, it laterally flexes the vertebral column to the same side. In addition, the superior portion, the longissimus capitis, laterally flexes and rotates the neck to the same side. It is innervated by the dorsal rami of spinal... Don't care. Uh, and I'm going to leave spinalis for you to watch yourself. It's on mastering. It's kind of very much the same sort of thing. Whenever you do both of them together, they straighten your back. Whenever you do one on the side, it pulls you over to the side. Um, and that's the end of part A. Let's go into part B. If you haven't uh, got it, then why not? Told you earlier, we will finish A and B today. And here goes B. Um, we're still in the um, muscles of the chest. We're going to deal with muscles of respiration, which is breathing. And there are um, three major muscles. Um, there are three groups we're going to take a look at that are the main muscles involved with breathing. And there are the intercostals, which means between the ribs, in two layers. The external intercostals are the outer layer. The internal costals are the inner layer, and then there's the diaphragm. It would be ever so lovely, because what do you do when you breathe? You inhale and then you exhale. Wouldn't it be lovely if the internals helped you inhale and the externals helped you exhale? That would be ever so wonderful, but guess what? They don't. Instead, you've got to remember that it's backwards. So which ones help you inhale? External intercostals. Which one help you then exhale? internals. I'm going to show you those on the uh, chest plate from the Anna model in a few minutes, but let's kind of quickly also mention the other one. The diaphragm is an upside down bowl shaped mu muscle. It's easy to see on the Tommy and the Anna model. This makes the partition or the boundary between the chest and the abdomen. It's basically the floor of the chest and the roof of the abdomen, and it is the most important muscle in breathing. And we'll look at the intercostals in a minute, but I want to show you the. Uh, where did my? There it went. Uh, I want to show you the uh, diaphragm on the Tommy and the Anna model first, and then we'll look at the intercostals. Kind of works out uh, a little bit better because I can get the big models out of the way, and then we can come back and look at the uh, little thing. So Tommy and Anna come up on carts. Come over in front of the camera. For those of you who are blocking your view, forgive me. It's getting caught on integrity. And I'll move as much out of the way as I can. Camera comes here. And now we're going to look at the diaphragm first. OK. Looking inside Tommy's chest, uh, or his abdomen, really. Chest is up here. Abdomen's down here. And this bowl right here is the diaphragm muscle. And as I move this a little closer, and tilt the camera up. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. This kind of dome shape here is the diaphragm. As I turn Anna around, you can see another feature of this. The middle of it actually is a big old tendon sheet. So on Anna, it's white. And that's actually a little more anatomically correct. But this dome of muscle over here, this bowl of muscle right here, is what we're talking about as the diaphragm. And you can see the shape of it as I lift the camera up. Turning Tommy around. Again, you can see this is that dome shape I was talking about. And what happens, let me see if I can balance this camera on my screen so I can kind of set it down and use two hands. Hey, that actually isn't too bad. Uh, what happens is when this muscle goes from being domed up to flattened out, it drops the chest by about that much, and it increases the volume. And it's like pulling the plunger on a syringe. If you had the end of a syringe stuck in a glass of water and you pulled on the syringe, what happens to the space inside the syringe? You fill it up with water, right? If you drop the floor of this, you fill the lungs up with air. So the diaphragm is the main muscle of inhaling or inspiration. Let me show you now the intercostals or the between the rib muscles. And the best place really to see that is on the Anna model chest. And as I bring this up, again, the, the direction of the grain of the meat, to say it as nicely as I can, really is key to understanding this stuff. So let me uh, brace 
this up with our half head model if it will brace. Hang on. Maybe I can brace Anna with her own head. It's just weird. All right, I'm going to sneak this up against the cart and hopefully that'll help. That's about as much help as I'm going to get. All right. Here. Look between Anna's ribs. Again, the external is the outer layer. This actually isn't too bad if I can hold my hand steady. The external is the outer layer. The internal is the inner layer. And as we look right here, can you see that one has got a set of fibers that are kind of going down and toward the front, and the other is going down and flaring out to the outside? This is the external layer, and this is the internal layer. These, by the way, are the muscles you eat when you eat barbecued ribs. So if you want to freak people out at your next barbecue uh, lunch and then talk to them about the fact that they're eating the external and internal intercostal muscles. That's exactly what you're consuming at that point. And if you notice here, as we look at the uh, chest, the externals angle that way, and the internals angle back the opposite way. And here we see that same sort of thing graphically. The externals are the outer layer, and their muscle fibers are called all kind of angling down and toward the front. I'm not going to sketch in all of those fiber directions, but you can see what I'm doing here. For the internals, they go back the opposite way. And for both of these individuals, front goes that way. Internals are underneath the externals, which kind of makes sense. A um, couple of pictures or a couple of animations with what we just looked at here is the externals. The of the external intercostals are from the inferior borders of the ribs above. The fibers pass obliquely and inferiorly to insert onto the superior borders of the ribs below. The external intercostals elevate the rib cage during inspiration. They are innervated by the intercostal nerves. The origins of the internal intercostals are from the inferior borders of the ribs and costal cartilages above. The fibers pass inferiorly and posteriorly to insert onto the superior borders of the ribs and costal cartilages below. The internal intercostals, especially the posterior portion, depress the rib cage during forced expiration. They are innervated by the intercostal nerves. And lastly, the diaphragm, which we can see here from an underside view. It's a big dome-shaped sheet of muscle. It's got a wide, broad, white tendon in the middle. And the interesting thing about the diaphragm is it's a big upside-down bowl of muscle uh, shaped like a big old bowl, and it has a few holes in it for the inferior vena cava, the aorta, and the esophagus. And this is the stuff that if this were a cow, we would call, any guesses, skirt steak diaphragm. So the next time you're having fajitas, the most popular cut for fajitas is skirt steak. And just look at mom and smile and say, hey, you're eating cow diaphragms. You know that? Freaks mom out like crazy. I know I did it for years. Pardon? There you go. Muscles of the abdominal wall. We have four different muscles I want to talk about that have to do with the abdominal wall, basically your belly wall. This is actually built in layers, and if you look at my hands real quick, let's go back to the camera. We have basically four pairs of muscle. There's, of course, right and left for each of these. There is a vertical pair that you would refer to kind of casually as six-packs. Really, they're eight-packs, but on me, it's more like a little tiny beer keg. Uh, and you also have a set where the fibers go like this like a V pointing down at your crotch. That would be the outer layer called the external oblique. If you peel those away, underneath them there's another layer, and their fibers are like a fan. On the bottom they point down, on the top they point up, and in the middle they kind of point across. That's the underneath the external, we have the internal oblique. If we peel those away, and we're down on the very inside, you've got fibers that are going pretty much just straight across. Those are the transverse. So we have external oblique, internal oblique, and then finally transverse going straight across. And the best place to see those is kind of on Anna and Tommy. Here do you see the uh, pack thing? It's really like a one, two, three, four pack. 
on either side, so four and four would be eight. That would be the rectus abdominis. Down in the very center, we've got a white line called the white line, or linea alba, which is the proper name for that. And then on Tommy, on his chest plate here, you can see, if I get closer, the direction of that grain, you see it? Angled down, that's external oblique. If we peel that away, which we can't do on the plastic, but look on the other side, here the fibers kind of fan out, and what you see right there is internal oblique. You've got to look inside to see the fibers going side to side. You see those? Those are transverse. And if you look at the edge of the body wall, you can even, if I get the camera just right, see that that's three layers, and that would be external, internal, and transverse. The key here is to realize that the internal is not the very inside. The very inside goes completely straight across, and we call those transverse. So it's external, then internal, and then on the very inside, transverse. And the direction of the fibers kind of shows it all. Uh, rectus abdominis was the six-pack thing. In the A, we've got good pictures. Rectus abdominis are these. The external oblique goes like this. And they've cut that away here. And underneath, we can see the internals, which fan kind of down. Uh, they kind of do a whole show. And then the transverse on the very inside goes just straight across. So there are those four different muscles, uh, four on the left, four on the right, so four pairs. Um, these kind of run at angles to each other, and that layering that we just saw gives this whole body wall um, reinforcement. You are containing your intestines here, and it kind of helps keep everything contained inside. They give you the ability to laterally flex and rotate the trunk. They let you, and you've all probably felt this, um, setting on the pot and needing to have a poop, and you've got to squeeze a little bit to push it out. That pressing in on your belly, or a force to exhale where you're breathing out really, really hard. To, <sighs> you're kind of squeezing with your belly to do that. So they help urination, defecation, childbirth, vomiting, coughing, and screaming. Uh, and here we see the external, internal, and uh, transverse, and yay. We have some videos. The origins of the external obliques are from ribs 5 through 12. The insertions of the external obliques are to the linea alba via its aponeurosis, the pubic crests and tubercles, and the iliac crests. Acting bilaterally, the external obliques support and compress the abdomen and flex the vertebral column anteriorly. Setups. Acting unilaterally, the external oblique laterally flexes and rotates the vertebral column to the opposite side. Working on your love handles. With compressive effect on the abdomen, the external obliques raise intra-abdominal pressure and assist in forced expiration. They are innervated by the intercostal nerves. Internals, very much the same. Oops. The origins of the internal it, sorry. obliques are from the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliac crests, and the inguinal ligaments. The insertions are to the linea alba via a broad aponeurosis, the pubic crests, and ribs 10 through 12. Acting bilaterally, the internal obliques support and compress the abdomen raise intra-abdominal pressure, and flex the vertebral column anteriorly. Acting unilaterally, the internal oblique laterally flexes and rotates the vertebral column to the same side. Due to the compressive effect on the abdomen, the internal obliques assist in forced expiration. They are innervated by the intercostal don't care. Rectus abdominis, the uh, six pack, if you will. The origins of the rectus abdominis muscles are from the pubic symphysis and the pubic crests. The insertions are to the xiphoid process of the sternum and the costal cartilages of ribs five through seven. The rectus abdominis muscles flex the vertebral column anteriorly. 
Rectus abdominis muscles also increase intra-abdominal pressure for abdominal breathing as during childbirth. They are innervated by the intercostal nerves. Kind of interesting to see these muscles isolated from each other and watch what they did to the skeleton. The origins of the transversus abdominis muscles are from the inner surfaces of costal cartilages 7 through 12, the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliac crests, and the inguinal ligaments. The insertions are to the linea alba via a broad aponeurosis. The pubic crest. Before I leave that, you guys do understand what the word aponeurosis is, right? It's a broad, flat, sheet-like tendon. And the pectineal line of the pubic bones. The transversus abdominis muscles compress the abdomen and in doing so, raise intra-abdominal pressure and assist in forced expiration. They are innervated by the intercostal nerves. Okay, those are your abdominal muscles. Our next target here is muscles of the pelvic floor. These make up the bottom of the bowl of the pelvis and they support organs like the uh, urinary bladder, the uterus, they kind of contain all of the stuff that sets down inside your pelvis. So let's take a look at uh, several of those along the way, including very interestingly named muscles like levator ani. What does the levator ani do? Lifts the anus, absolutely. And coccygeus, both of these are innervated by sacral nerves. Uh, the function of this pelvic floor area is to seal off the lower outlet of the pelvis, that exit that a baby would take during delivery, support the pelvic organs, lift the floor to help in releasing feces, and to resist an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, we'll also look at muscles of the perineum. The perineum is the area between your urethral opening that you urinate through and your anal opening is that area between there. And it's made up of a set of muscles that kind of as a group are called the urogenital diaphragm. This is the front half of the perineum. It's inferior to the pelvic floor. And we have a deep perineal, deep transverse perineal muscle and an external urethral sphincter. It's worth mentioning here that everybody, male and female, has an external urethral sphincter. And this is that muscle that you voluntarily relax, voluntarily relax in order to urinate. Uh, males, but not females, have got an internal urethral sphincter. And the purpose for that is the internal, not the external, actually closes off and seals the bladder during ejaculation because urine actually is toxic to semen. But hey, that's a lecture for April. So uh, everybody, male and female, have got an external sphincter. And here's a picture of some of this stuff. Uh, we'll see the uh, other view a little bit later on. This is a top-down view. This is to the front. This is to the back. And we're looking from the top down inside the pelvis. And we see several, sorry, several things going on here. We have three openings visible. That opening is the urethra. The opening in the middle here, which is kind of rectangular in this image, is the vagina. And the opening in the back would be the anal canal. Pretty clearly, we're looking inside a female pelvis. This sheet of muscle is the urogenital diaphragm. This muscle here is the pubococcygeus, and that actually is the target of P, C, or Kegel exercises uh, that are used to strengthen this pelvic floor sometimes after pregnancy. Here we see the pelvic diaphragm described as two separate muscles, the levator ani, which is right here, and the coccygeus, which is right back here, and this muscle on the side here, which is the iliococcygeus. Um, this muscle in the very back is the piriformis, and that one actually shows up pretty well in the Anna model, I believe. Let's see if we can get Anna over here and show us her piriformis muscle. Where's she hiding from me? Here we go. Up in front of the podium. Very much toward the back.
right back in here we've got a piriformis. So a lot of these things we can see. I'm going to let you find a lot of those on your own. That's part of the fun of this. And here we have sort of a little more intimate view of some of these models. Uh, I do not have uh, a whole lot of these visible on uh, some of our models, but you can see uh, we're actually looking at the uh, kind of the from the outside up close and personal view. There's this external urethral sphincter in both males and females that kind of surrounds the urethra, and whenever that sphincter is squeezed closed, you're not urinating, which is, I hope, where everybody in the room is right now. You probably all have a very tightly constricted external urethral sphincter. Um, this muscle here is the deep transverse perennial muscle, and on males, it's connected by a central tendon, and on females, there's still a central tendon, but it has the opening of the vagina kind of embedded in the middle of this deep transverse perennial muscle. Of course, both males and females have got an external anal sphincter. That's the one that we hope you're keeping closed right now. And in the middle of that, there's an anus. And that, I think, covers everything we need to see muscle-wise from this particular view. Um, if we look a little deeper, sorry, a little more superficial. These are not quite as deep as the ones we usually looked at. We have ischiocavernosis, bulbospongiosis, and some superficial across the way, side-to-side -side transverse perineal muscles, and as well as the external anal sphincter in the back half of the perineum. And here is a really up-close and personal view of some of these. We've got butt cheeks or gluteus maximus visible right here. The levator ani for lifting the anus is right here in both male and female. Uh, and here we start to get a little bit interesting, where we see some kind of maybe unexpected uh, shared muscles between the male and female. We have the superficial transverse perennial, which is this strap that goes uh, under the base of the vagina at the top of the anus in both males and females. No real surprises there yet, but if we come up a little bit, in fact, let me just change colors go to yellow for bulbospongiosis. The bulbospongiosis wraps around the base of the shaft of the penis about halfway up. And it also wraps around the outside of the vagina. So that same muscle is serving two different purposes in male and female. It helps to control motility uh, in both the penis and the vagina, but in radically different ways. Then we have a strap of muscle called the ischiocavernosis that attaches about halfway up the penis and comes down and attaches to some skeletal elements, and it does the same sort of thing in the female, but instead of attaching to the penis, it attaches to the base of the clitoris. So we got some interesting variations in the anatomy here with different muscles performing slightly different jobs in male and female. Uh, muscles in the chest is where we're going to go next, but I think we're going to kind of take that little natural shift in the program and have our break here, our last break, and we'll come back and pick up at this point. So see you in about five or six minutes and we'll get going here. So a slightly shortened break. All right, we are back from the break, and we are now going to move into muscles of the chest and the shoulder. Um, we're going to look at some extrinsic, which means the outer layer of the shoulder muscles. Uh, there are actually two videos here, which I know are broken. This one and this one don't play, so I've got to go find them. We're looking at muscles that act on the shoulder and the humerus. There's an overview. Part A and Part B, and frankly, neither one of them tell us a whole lot, but I'll go ahead and dive in and find these anyway. It takes a little bit of diving in, so I don't need the uh, integrity people to watch me doing the diving in, but I'll show you the videos. Ah! Dang it. The shoulder joint is the most flexible joint in the body. Therefore, the muscles that act on the joint must show extensive mobility and consequently exhibit an especially complex array. <laughs> And that's all for that video. 
all that fight for that little bit, although there's one more. Shoulder humerus B. However, the muscles of the shoulder can be divided into separate groups based on distribution and functional relationships. These groups consist of muscles that act on the pectoral girdle, specifically the scapula. The muscles of the rotator cuff are those that stabilize the glenohumeral joint, and muscles that cross the glenohumeral joint and act on the humerus. And that's frankly all for those two videos. Oh well, and they're the only ones that weren't linked, so the rest of these will be linked and we can see these just fine. Here's our next page. There's a little ink for that page. We're going to take a look at some of the uh, in extrinsic muscles on the front, which means the muscles that are closer to the surface. And we're going to look at uh, several of these, including pectoralis major and minor, serratus anterior, and subclavius. And we'll take a look at some videos first, and then I'll show you some of these muscles on our Tommy guy. So let's play this first one. The pectoral girdle refers to the bony arch formed by the clavicle and the scapula. The primary function of the pectoral girdle is to act as an attachment point for the muscles that provide arm movement at the shoulder joint. It also provides the only connection between the arm and the axial skeleton. I just realized while I was moving stuff that I needed to have uh, kind of both views of Tommy, so I'm not going to put the other model up there that I needed. So let's take a look at this next video real quick. The muscles that act on the pectoral girdle, specifically the scapula, can be divided into anterior and posterior groups. Two muscles comprise the anterior group, the pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior. The pectoralis minor muscle originates on the anterior surfaces of ribs 3 to 5 and inserts on the coracoid process of the scapula. The serratus anterior muscle originates from ribs 1 to 8 and inserts on the anterior vertebral border of the scapula. Okay, looking at our Tommy model, which we're about to be doing, you can see both the pectoral, whoa, hello, the uh, pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior. You know what, let me see if I can't get this on the side so I'm not blocking the view of the people here in the front. I think our camera will reach that direction. And it will. I want to show you pectoralis minor, and while I'm there, I'll go ahead and show you pectoralis major, and I want to show you serratus while we're there as well. In this view, with the camera kind of tilted up, and a little bit of light coming on to Tommy, we can see here in the chest, this band of muscles is pectoralis minor. Uh, the video said very correctly that these typically are attached to ribs three, four, and five. In this particular case, I don't know if it's an error with the model. I have heard that sometimes you have individuals that kind of play this way. Uh, we have an extra rib here. This one's attached to rib number six. So this is pectoralis minor. It uh, is attached here on the ribs and up on the shoulder as well. Pectoralis major is over on the other side. And here on Tommy, we can see the big pectoralis major muscle, which you'd have to cut out of the way in order to see the pectoralis minor which we're looking at right over here. Now, serratus anterior. What does the word serratus sound like? Serrated. And if you look at Tommy's side, these look like the edge of a steak knife. And those little points on each rib are serratus anterior. And they're really, really easy to spot. Once you see them, you can't really miss them. They kind of jump out at you. Like, oh, yeah, that's the one that looks like the edge of a steak knife. And we go back here. Thought we were there already. Hey, we are. Um, in this particular picture, we can still see the uh, pectoralis minor, which I just get back there. Just showed you pectoralis minor is here. 
three through five, ribs three through five, and the serratus will go for blue on that one, serratus anterior. Thought I got blue, but I don't think I did. Serratus anterior we have right here, coming down on each individual rib. We also have here on Tommy's chest, pectoralis major, which you've got to cut out of the way in order to see the pectoralis minor. So here's a couple of videos for you on those. Pectoralis minor first. The origins of pectoralis minor are from ribs three through five. The insertion is to the coracoid process of the scapula. With the origin fixed, pectoralis minor tilts the scapula anteriorly. With the insertion fixed, it draws the rib cage superiorly to aid in forced inspiration. It is innervated by the pectoral nerves. All right, now serratus anterior. Oops, that was supposed to be a video, not a click. The origins of serratus anterior are from ribs one through eight. The insertion is to the costal surface of the medial border of the scapula. Serratus anterior abducts the scapula and laterally rotates the scapula upward by moving the glenoid cavity superiorly and the inferior angle laterally. The superior fibers elevate the scapula while the inferior fibers depress it. It is innervated by the long thoracic nerve. Okay, next page. We here move around to the back, and we're going to look at trapezius, levator scapulae. By the way, that is a typo right there. That should be scapulae. There's an A that belongs right in there. Uh, and also the rhomdoideus. There's two rhomdoideus, the major and the minor. And for a lot of this, I want to bring up a model that I don't use often. This is a model that I call the pink lady because she shows a lot of this stuff very, very nicely. She shows trapezius, levator scapulae, and rhomdoids really, really well. So let's look at these two videos, then we'll look at the pink lady model. There are four muscles that comprise the posterior group. The levator scapulae, the rhomboid minor, the rhomboid major, and the trapezius. The levator scapulae muscle originates on the transverse processes of vertebrae C1 through C4 and inserts on the medial border of the scapula, just superior to the spine of the scapula. The rhomboid minor muscle originates on the spinous processes of vertebrae C7 through T1 and inserts on the medial border of the scapula at the level of the spine of the scapula. The rhomboid major muscle originates on the spinous processes of thoracic vertebrae 2 through 5 and inserts on the medial border of the scapula inferior to the spine of the scapula. The trapezius muscle originates on the external occipital protuberance, the medial one-third of the superior nuchal line, and the spinous processes of vertebrae C7 through T12. Insertion of the trapezius muscle makes a continuous line from the acromion and spine of the scapula to the lateral one-third of the clavicle. Okay, I'm going blank. Did I click the first one or the second one? I think I clicked the first one, didn't I? Yeah. Get back there. The scapula of the pectoral girdle is loosely attached to the thoracic cage and consequently capable of considerable movement. To best illustrate the scapular movements, six actions of the scapula will be animated. Lateral rotation or raising of the glenoid cavity medial rotation, or lowering the glenoid cavity, elevation, depression, protraction, and retraction. Lateral rotation of the scapula results from contraction of the serratus anterior and the trapezius muscles. Medial rotation results from the contraction of the levator scapulae and the rhomboid major and minor muscles. Elevation of the scapula occurs through the levator scapulae 
the major and minor rhomboids, and the trapezius muscles. Depression of the scapula is caused by the serratus anterior and the trapezius muscles. Scapular protraction is caused by the serratus anterior and the pectoralis minor muscles. Scapular retraction is caused by both rhomboids and the trapezius muscle. Okay. They've talked about a lot of motions there. They also mentioned the pectoralis minor and the uh, serratus. Uh, we saw the pectoralis minor and the serratus on the Tommy model. Uh, I want to show you the uh, levator scapulae, the rhomboid major and the rhomboid minor on the pink lady model. Trapezius we'll also see on this model, but I want to save that one for a few minutes later. So I want to show you some more videos about the trapezius specifically before we do that. But for right now, let's look at levator scapulae, rhomboidus major and rhomboid minor on this pink lady model. So here we go to the pink lady. And as you look at her, I'm going to take the camera and come in really, really closely on her neck above her shoulder. Uh, right in here, and you guys need to help me figure out what you can see, this strap, you see the edge of it right here? That one is levator scapula, and it's attached on this upper corner of her scapula. If I rotate this just a little bit, this strap here and this one here are rhomboidus major, and this little bitty strap here is rhomboid minor. Can you all see that? Okay, minor, major's big, and way up out in front of this is levator scapula. So levator scapulae here, rhomboidus minor's next, and then rhomboidus major is the bigger of all of these. And again, we're looking back on her shoulder to see these. Major, minor, and then levator scapulae to lift the scapula. The big old fan we see on her side here, this is trapezius, and that's going to be some of the stuff we're going to next. So we'll be back to visit that in just a minute. Let's get back over to our presentation, which is there. All right, in this picture, we can see those three, really four muscles that I just showed you. This one up here, levator scapulae is attaching to this top corner right here, and levator scapulae lifts the scapula just like its name says. The next strap coming down, the little thin one here, is rhomboidus minor. All of these show up no place else in the lab except the pink lady model. Do not hijack her before the final. And then below that we have, let's do this one in green. Oh, I didn't get green. I hate when that happens. Right here we have the rhomboidus major. It's the thickest of all of those three straps. And there's the rhomboidus major. Now, while I've still got this picture here, I want to show you some stuff about the scapula that we're not going to quite talk about here. We'll look at this stuff on Thursday, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it. The scapula right here has got a spine in it. Remember the spine from when we did the, when we did the bones? Above the spine, we've got a muscle called the supraspinatus, above the spine. Its name makes great sense. And if you remember from when we looked at the bone itself, that little hollow space in there was called the supraspinous fossa. Below it, we had a space called the infraspinous fossa, and now in there, we're going to put a muscle called the infraspinatus. There's also a couple of muscles below that, teres minor and teres major. One of those is and one of those is not part of the uh, rotator cuff. We'll talk about which one is and which is not later on. That actually will come on Thursday. But now let's look at the last muscle on this particular picture I want to show you which is the trapezius, and boy is this ever a complicated muscle. It attaches here on the uh, edge of the shoulder and it goes up onto the neck. It also goes straight over and attaches to your vertebrae in the middle of your chest, and it comes down pretty deep into the chest. So it actually has three different groups of fibers, some point up, some point down, and some point kind of sideways. So you can imagine that this is involved in raising your shoulder, and pulling your shoulder down, and then pulling your shoulder back toward the center of your spine. So it's a complex muscle, and you do different things depending on which part of it you activate. So let's take a quick look at the uh, trapezius, then levator scapula, then the rhomboid major, and rhomboid minor. 
And you know what? I think I'm going to save the trapezius for last. So don't let me skip the trapezius. I want to come back and get it in a minute. Leave it or scapulate. This is a busy video, that first one. So we'll save it for the last here. This is leave. The origins of levator scapula are from the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae one through four. The insertion is to the upper one third of the medial border of the scapula. Levator scapula elevates the scapula and pulls the glenoid cavity inferiorly. It is innervated by the cervical nerves and the dorsal scapular nerve. Okay, that's levator scapula. Yeah, scapula, which lifts the scapula. Rhomdoideus minor, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just go from top to bottom on these. So we'll do Rhomdoideus minor next. The origins of rhomboid minor are from the ligamentum nuchae and the spinous processes of vertebrae C7 and T1. The insertion is to the medial border of the scapula. Rhomboid minor elevates the scapula, adducts the scapula, and immediately rotates the scapula downward by moving the glenoid cavity inferiorly and the inferior angle medially. It is innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. Okay, and as we continue down the arm, we're going to next get to the rhomboid major. The origins of rhomboid major are from the spinous processes of vertebrae T2 through T5. The insertion is to the medial border of the scapula. Rhomboid major <coughs> elevates the scapula, adducts the scapula, and immediately rotates the scapula downward by moving the glenoid cavity inferiorly and the inferior angle medially. It is innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. Now, just by way of reminder, back over on our pink lady model, You can see all of those. So which one would this be? I'll give you a hand. It's the top of the three. Okay. Yep, levator scapulae. This little strap here, rom minor. minor, and the wider strap here, rom major. Yay. This big fan here, oops, you can't see that. That's her butt. Maybe that's a big fan. I don't know. Stop it. I'm trying to get this camera to tilt up. Uh, this big fan along, damn it, this big fan along here is the trapezius, and it's where we're going next. Stop that. Jeez. Um, help me out here. Is that the last slide? I think it is, isn't it? Yes? Okay. Well, we're not quite finished here, but let's go ahead and finish those. What do you mean, yay? I'm not, I'm not done. Apparently, we're still looking at Anna's bottom. There we go. All right, trapezius is next. And as we look at this... Yes, is the large trapezoid-shaped muscle located in the posterior thorax and neck. All of that kite shape, that diamond shape you see there, all of that is trapezius. It may be separated into three groups of fibers. Look at the blue. Superior, middle, and inferior. The For all of these... Stop and think. Look where it's highlighted in blue. If those fibers got shorter, what would happen? Here we go. Origins of the superior fibers are from the external occipital protuberance, the superior nuchal line, the ligamentum nuchae, and the spinous process of vertebrae C7. The insertions are to the lateral one-third of the clavicle and the chromion of the scapula. With the origin fixed, the superior fibers elevate the scapula, gliding it toward the skull. The superior fibers also laterally rotate the scapula upward. With the insertion fixed and the muscle contracting on one side only, the superior fibers laterally flex and rotate the head and neck to the opposite side. With the insertion fixed and the muscle contracting on both sides, the superior fibers extend the neck. The superior fibers are innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. Before we leave that entirely, they were talking about some odd stuff there. They said if the origin was fixed, which means the area on the back of the head was fixed, then you're lifting your shoulder. How are you fixing the origin? Basically, you're tightening the front neck muscles and not letting your head flop around. So you hold your head steady, 
That means you're anchoring at the base of your neck, and whenever you tighten the upper part of this muscle, the only thing you do is for your shoulder to rise. Then they talked about the insertion being fixed. If you basically hold your shoulder firm and tighten that muscle, then you're pulling your head over in a corner. If it's one side only, what happens if you're pulling both sides at the same time? You're looking up. So you can, by choice, choose to hold your head still or choose to hold your shoulder still. And as you tighten that muscle, one of those two has to I mean you could go floppy on both of them and do this weird thing where you're pulling your head over and raising your shoulder. And at that point, you can unfix both of them. Let's go to the middle of this where I've got a cute weird story. Sorry? Um, they have different skeletal muscular structure, and their anatomy can vary with their range of motion depending on how their muscles and skeletons built. And it depends on which animal you're talking about. Are innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. The origins of the middle fibers are from the spinous processes of vertebrae T1 through T5. The insertions are to the medial border of the acromion and the superior lip of spine of the scapula. With the now watch how these move, because I've got a weird story coming up here in just a second. Origin fixed. The middle fibers adduct the scapula. This is a gliding movement toward midline. The middle fibers are innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. The origins of the inferior fibers... Oops, I didn't want to jump quite there yet. I wanted to tell you the weird story. Um, you know, I told you about being the whole Charles in charge living nanny guy when I was in grad school. And I took care of two kids. Uh, and I mentioned, I'm pretty sure that the daughter was a dancer. I don't know if I mentioned or not that the son, Michael, uh, who is older now and frankly not much nicer a kid he's still a good kid he's just a little bit of a wild child in his middle 20s um, he was uh, his sister was a dancer and he was a singer uh, and when I say he was a singer I mean he was a singer extraordinaire he was in the Texas Boys Choir which is a world class boys choir they literally travel all around the world uh, and they do this every year um, they go on tour and these boys basically go to school in Fort Worth, Texas at the Boys Choir building. Now, he lived in Denton and went in a carpool every day with a group of boys who lived in Denton and drove over to Fort Worth to go to school. And then uh, when they got around to tour time, typically around Christmas, they would go on tour sometimes for a week or more on the road. And they are absolutely stunningly beautiful. In fact, as we get close to Christmas time, because we're getting sneaking up on it right now. I may even break out some Texas Boys Choir music and play you a few Christmas songs. Well, Michael, the kid that I took care of, was one of their was the lead soloist for about two years running. Again, this is a group of nine to eighteen year old boys, and they take them out on the road to do performances around the country and in some cases around the world. Um, at the time Michael was in the choir, the choir director was a man, really nice man by the name of Jack Noble White. And any time you take a bus of 70 to 80 boys, age 9 to 18, on the road, you have to have a hotel for them to sleep in. You have to feed them because they burn a whole lot of energy. You have to feed these boys. And every once in a very great while, uh, Mr. White made a bad decision on where to house and or feed these children. And on one particularly memorable occasion, he made an exceptionally bad choice as to where to take a group of 9 to 18-year-old boys. If you had to pick the worst of the worst places to take a group of adolescent boys, where would you pick the worst possible place to take them? Any guesses? Hooters, yes. So they took these boys to Hooters, and the uh, choir director headed off to the bathroom at some point. Now, he had other adults helping to sponsor this, but when he came back from the bathroom, he found a challenge going on. A challenge that, unfortunately, the kid I was taking care of, Michael, had initiated along with a couple of his buddies. It was a contest between the choir boys, who had promised to sing a really pretty song, and the Hooters waitresses, who were challenged to see who could most effectively touch their elbows behind their backs. Yeah, oh my God. So it was kind of like we're having a little anatomy lesson there. It was kind of an impromptu anatomy lesson that the boys had tried to get. And the point here is when this middle area lighted up blue is contracted, it does that. It pulls the shoulders toward the middle of the spine. Yay, so much for that story. Now let's look at the bottom section. 
the middle fibers are innervated by this. By the way, I don't tell that story for shock value. I tell it to help you remember that the trapezius does radically different things, whether we're contracting the bottom, middle, or top of it. Each area does radically different movements. Final accessory nerve. Look bottom the now. The of the inferior fibers are from the spinous processes of vertebrae T6 through T12. The insertion is to the tubercle of the spine of the scapula. With the origin fixed, the inferior fibers depress the scapula, gliding it inferiorly. The inferior fibers also laterally rotate the scapula upward. The inferior fibers are innervated by the spinal except... Don't really care about the innervation right now. So my point is, we've got a single diamond shape or kite-shaped muscle. The top part of it is going to raise the shoulders or rotate your head. The bottom part is going to lower your shoulders, and the middle part will actually pull your shoulders more midline. So the point here is, depending on which particular fibers you innervate, you get different actions out of this muscle. And that is the end of this. We've got about 15 minutes left. Question? Okay. We've got about 15 minutes left, and my suggestion is spend some time in the lab. Go down the list in the lab book and find these different muscles. I'll be around for a little bit if you'd like some help, either in this lab or in the tutoring lab. I'm going to put some equipment away. And if you're uh, here in the lab when I get back, I'll be happy to answer your questions.